Okay, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Great, good morning. Thank you for joining us just two days in advance of World Prematurity Day 2016. We're here to launch the international joint statement for kangaroo mother care, for universal use of kangaroo mother care for preterm and low birth weight babies. My name is Dr. Bina Valsenkar. I'm a newborn advisor at, um, at Save the Children and a pediatrician. And I'm thrilled to be here with our panel of KMC experts and advocates. As we finish a tumultuous US election season and we welcome a new UN Secretary General in 2017 and we close our first year of the Sustainable Development Goals, it is timely and very extra important to push forward our unfinished preterm agenda. Prematurity is now the leading cause of under five deaths worldwide. And if we want to achieve our global goal of, of eliminating preventable newborn and child deaths, we have to address prematurity. <clears throat> but prematurity is not just an issue that lies beyond our borders. In the US, prematurity is on the rise, and it's particularly on the rise among our vulnerable and poorest communities. So prematurity is therefore not a niche issue. It's also an equity issue. It's a child health issue, it's a maternal health issue, it's a health systems issue, it's a prevention issue, and it's a health workforce issue. So when we accelerate our agenda for preventing preterm births and addressing preterm births, we accelerate so much more. And one way to do this is with kangaroo mother care, or KMC. KMC is care of preterm infants carried skin to skin with the mother or other caretaker and exclusive breastfeeding or feeding with breast milk. The World Health Organization recommends KMC to improve preterm birth outcomes. In low-income countries, KMC has been shown to reduce, significantly reduce infection and death, and in high-income countries to significantly improve breastfeeding. But despite this, the, the uptake, the global uptake of kangaroo mother care remains low. There are many barriers to the uptake of KMC, but one of these is resistance and poor acceptance from health professionals. This joint statement is a first step to addressing that barrier, providing vetting and assurance from prominent and respected healthcare, uh, health professional associations that KMC can be worth the investment. The joint, the joint statement sets forth three basic principles. First, that KMC offers benefits to premature newborns in all settings and all income levels. Second, the decision to invest in KMC should be guided by the evidence of the benefit KMC may offer in a given setting. And finally, that KMC is an effective and efficient complementary aspect of investing in and developing more advanced neonatal care. To date, this joint statement has been endorsed by six professional associations. And we, hope, we truly hope that this is just the launch and the beginning of several professional associations taking this forward, um, endorsing, adapting, adopting, and using it as seen fit to promote kangaroo mother care and push forward our preterm agenda. Um, before we begin our panel, I want to thank some of our professional associations that have endorsed but were not able to join us at this panel, including the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the International Council of Nurses, the International Federation of um, Gynecology and Obstetrics, and then also to the international development partners who have been critical in um, seeing this through to fruition, um, including Save the Children and USAID projects, the Mater Maternal Child Survival Program, Every Preemie Scale, and the ASSIST Project. So thank you to all of those. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce to you our first panelist, Dr. Sarah Berkelhammer. Dr. Berkelhammer is a clinical associate professor of neonatal and perinatal medicine at the University of Buffalo in New York. She's also the co-chair of the Helping Baby Survive Committee, and she's here representing the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Berkelhammer. Thank you. It's um, a truly an honor to be here to in, on behalf of the AP today in our support of the policy statement for universal use of KMC for preterm and low birth weight infants. Um, as Bina has elegantly noted, prematurity is the leading cause of neonatal deaths globally. And I would also add that inadequate progress has been made to reduce this burden. We as an academy support the use of KMC or skin-to-skin -skin care with exclusive breastfeeding as it has been shown to be beneficial in both low, mid, and high-income countries. While the benefits will clearly vary based on the practice and environment, these can include, as Bina has noted, improved thermal regulation with less risk of hypothermia, reduced rates of mortality, reduced rates of sepsis, improved breastfeeding, as well as growth and developmental benefits. 
In conjunction with this statement, we've reviewed available evidence and support the WHO recommendations for routine use of KMC in infants less than 2,000 grams with practices as close as possible to continuous or intermittent when not possible. We do believe that the Academy's endorsement will encourage implementation efforts, will promote KMC education, and can advocate for resource allocation to support KMC practices. We recognize that this investment, as Bina has pointed out, in KMC needs to be guided by the evidence of benefits that can be offered in a given setting and acknowledge that there will be barriers to scale up. Nonetheless, we would highlight that KMC represents one of the most cost-effective, safe, and both physiologic and socially appropriate care practices to improve newborn outcomes globally. As a neonatologist and a global health advisor, I've been re involved in educational efforts to teach KMC and have observed the practice in a range of settings. I want to take a moment here to describe the practices that occur in the States, which we will also hear from our panel shortly. Um, in the NICU, it's the tiniest of babies who, can, who may even still be requiring respiratory support who can safely benefit from the use of skin-to-skin -skin care. These infants may weigh only a couple pounds at birth, may be small enough for you to hold in your single palms together. Um, these, sorry, um, I actually, I will turn to a family's voice on this fact and would like to share an experience from a family who had a six-year-old, who now has a six-year-old who was born three months early at 28 weeks gestation. This baby was just over a kilo at birth and the family shared some of their thoughts about the experience. Baby Libby um, was separated from her mom due to severe preeclampsia, and when dad went to visit, he found the NICU both overwhelming and intimidating. The medical equipment, alarms, monitors were foreign and overwhelming. He said his fear and anxiety were replaced by comfort and love when the NICU nurses helped on her first day to place her skin to skin on his chest. Uh, Libby's mother, Debbie, was also able to be involved in this type of care within a few days when she was better. She explained that this practice normalized parenting, solidified the bond that she had with her child, and provided a much-needed physical closeness. Debbie explained that allowing parents of sick and tiny preemies to love their babies with the same kind of physical contact that parents of full-term and healthy infants experience is a huge gift. The AAP is proud to endorse this policy statement and remains committed to these efforts in hopes that all small babies will be given the same chance to thrive and every parent the opportunity to enjoy the true gift of a healthy newborn. Thank you, Dr. Bucklehammer, for the high income country perspective. I think we can all agree that there is a lot um, of lessons learned across the board, high income, middle income, and low income. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Kate McHugh. Um, she is a senior technical advisor in the Department of Global Outreach at the American College of Nurse Midwives. Thank you, everybody. I'm uh, here representing the American College of Nurse Midwives and also uh, the Survive and Thrive Global Development Alliance, which is a partnership of professional associations NGOs and governmental entities uh, working on maternal and child survival. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, before I became a midwife, I was a neonatal intensive care unit nurse, and I worked in a uh, tertiary referral hospital in St. Louis where many of the children had been brought from other states or you know, from the rural areas of Missouri, so they were separated from their parents. And I really uh, developed a very uh, large appreciation for the deleterious effects that can happen when th the family is separated from the care of a vulnerable child, a preterm baby or a sick baby. And uh, I spent a lot of my time in midwifery focusing on newborn issues. So I want to talk to you and, and give you a little vignette because uh, I'm going to try to take us out of the United States now and take us to other parts of the world. We could be in the Caribbean, we could be in South America, we could be in Asia, we could be in Africa. But we're in a district hospital in a rural area. The electricity is out tonight. The generator is working some of the time. I'm the midwife and I have a nurse with me. We have multiple people in labor. The nearest pediatric physician 
is in the capital, which is three hours away. And this is something that is very hard for us to conceptualize, the fact that pediatricians are rich and valuable resources that are so scarce in other parts of the world. A woman arrives, she's had one prenatal visit at one of our outlying clinics. It becomes clear that even though her belly is measuring small that she's about to give birth and she rapidly progresses. The midwife dries the baby and looks at it. She can see veins, she knows there's not much subcutaneous fat, she knows the baby's early. The baby's scrawny, it's probably less than 2,000 grams. She makes a fast decision. She's tired, she's got two other people in labor, she doesn't have any electricity, and she says to the mother, I'm sorry, he's too little. She wraps the baby in the piece of cloth, single plain piece of cloth the mother had brought, puts the baby aside, and an hour and a half later the baby is dead. This is a very, very common scenario. Now what can we do to change this kind of pattern? What we have to do here is to have our midwives and our nurses and our other frontline providers suspend their disbelief. Time after time, they have come to see that small babies do not live, and therefore they have a fatalistic attitude about small babies. So one of the goals of this project, in order for it to have the impact it can have, and I think it can have tremendous impact, is that we must help these providers suspend their disbelief and begin to believe that a small baby can survive and can thrive. So how are we gonna do this? When we have providers who are used to death in a way that no, very few developed world providers are used to the frequency of death that people in other parts of the world who are providers experience. So we have to change the paradigm. We have to introduce kangaroo mother care into the schools, into the in-service trainings that continue to provide the workforce, into the community health workers, because they're the first people to help to message to a community what's possible, long before the mothers at the health center or the district hospital in labor. Why are these people important? Because they are usually members of the community. Frequently, nurses or midwives are women and may have a little more credibility talking to a woman about her experience and what she can expect. And this will begin to change the paradigm. So I'm hoping that as we introduce KMC around the world, we, uh, we also have this go jointly with the type of training and education that will be needed to convince these providers to change their paradigm and suspend their disbelief. Finally, I think that the frontline providers are really key to engagement of the family. Many times I have heard colleagues talk about the fact that the provider wanted to make an intervention and the family blocked it because of their own disbelief that a child could survive and could thrive and not be a burden on the entire family. And this is a, a, a part of this that needs to be worked on too as we introduce KMC. We have to respect the fact that we are asking the mother to do something extraordinary. She's going to be spending many, many hours a day or an adolescent daughter or a grandmother skin to skin with a frail and vulnerable baby. We need to respect that, we need to reward it. Women are not just passive carriers of babies. They're making a choice too of how their time is spent. We're hoping that the midwives and nurses can help mothers and fathers and extended family mothers like grandma, grandmothers suspend their disbelief that they can help to teach the families the effective ways to provide this care, and that we can move on to see not just the physical benefit of KMC, which Sarah has mentioned many of the attributes of, but also the psychological benefits of making this vulnerable child part of the family, and therefore eligible for whatever resources the family has. So the American College of Nurse Midwives, with uh, working with multiple midwifery associations around the world is very pleased to support this statement. Uh, we think that this is a really important initiative and we look forward to working more on it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for vividly taking us beyond our borders and for representing the front lines of maternal newborn medicine.
Along that theme, um, our next speaker is here via a taped statement from Bangladesh. This is Dr. Mohammed Shahidullah, President of the Bangladesh Pediatric Association and Professor at Bangabadu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. The international in policy statement for universal use of kangaroo mother care for the preterm and low birth weight infants is an issue where we all should agree upon. This is a very useful modality. There cannot be any myth like this that this is as alternative for the low income countries or this can be only utilized in the resource limited conditions. High income countries it is also seen that is quite efficient and it supports the breastfeeding. Now as there is a international call it is now the time that we as professionals and academia should join this campaign and we should support it. In Bangladesh, the professional organizations have agreed to support this movement. Along with the government and the development partners, the good part is that in Bangladesh, this has been incorporated into the policy. From 2013, different uh, professional organizations we are observing this World Preterm Day on 17th of November. This year, 2016, we are also going to observe World Preterm Day where all the professional organizations who are working for maternal and newborn health are going to make a joint statement and that will be delivered officially. At the end, I like to thank all those organizations and associations who have brought out this very important international policy statement for universal use of kangaroo mother care for preterm and low birth weight infants and I wish a grand success of this initiative. He was unable to join us all the way from Bangladesh, but he <laughs> sends his regards. <laughs> um, the Bangladesh Pediatric Association is one of the first uh, professional associations to, to jump on this and take it forward. They're adapting it and working on it to make it their own, relevant to their country, and we, we hope to see that in, in other countries as well. So they will be an example going forward. Taking us back to Washington, D.C., our next speaker is Dr. Natalia Isaza. She's a neonatology attending and kangaroo mother care researcher at Children's National Health System. And she is working on introducing um, kangaroo mother care right here in our nation's capital. Hello, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to share a little bit about my experience with you. I'm from Colombia, where kangaroo mothers started. And I got my training in kangaroo care with the first hand um, in researches in kangaroo care. So I've been able to explore how kangaroo care um, impacts the life of preterm babies in low income countries. And now as a neonatologist in a level four NICU, I can also say what advantages kangaroo care provides, not only for the preterm babies, but also for the term babies that are sick and for the families that take care of fragile babies. So my idea is to talk a little bit about what we do in our NICU. As I said, we are level four, so we receive babies that are very sick, the sickest babies in the DC metropolitan area. And we started a couple of years ago using kangaroo care with the help of Marsha Dimes and with the idea of the nurses have to be trained, the, the physicians have to be trained, and we all agree in this is an important measurement, an important um, tool for health babies. So what we are seeing in our NICU is that not only the premature babies that are low, low birth are getting more weight and are getting the uh, effects of thermal regulation. We are seeing that sick babies are getting the advantages of breast milk. I'm going to talk a little bit about breast milk. When moms do kangaroo care, the breast milk production increases. And breast milk is medicine, it's gold for babies. 
We know that uh, breast milk helps with babies that have problems with the feeding, especially premature babies that can have severe problems and can cause death on these babies if their intestine doesn't work well. And we know breast milk helps with that. We know also that breast milk helps fighting infections. We know that babies in the NICU and premature babies have a very decreased defense mechanisms, meaning that they are prone to get infections. Breast milk helps with that. We also seen that um, breast uh, providing kangaroo care are help, is helping in stabilizing the vital signs of babies. So what we are seeing, Babies that are premature, babies that are sick, babies that, require, that are requiring um, tubes to breathe have more difficulties balancing their vital signs. And this is, as we said, vital. Kangaroo care is helping that. It's helping babies to breathe. It's helping babies to require less oxygen. It's helping babies to have a more regulated heart rate. We are also seeing that the oxygen consumption, oxygen is basic for the body that babies have in their brain and in the stomach is, help, is being helped by kangaroo care. We are also seeing advantages in the pain procedures. As we know, babies that are in the NICU that are exposed to many painful procedures. And doing kangaroo care as a simple way to have the baby on the, on the chest of the mom or the dad is actually helping the baby to deal with these painful procedures that unfortunately we'll see need to do. We are also seeing that um, the effect that the kangaroo care has in the parents is very important. As we heard before, having a baby in the NICU is a very stressful moment for the parents. Um, they are very stressed because probably they were not expecting to have a premature baby and most likely they were not expecting to have a sick term baby. So when they go to the NICU, first of all, they're being separated. We are not a burden hospital. When they're separating from their parents, they see this environment that can be overwhelming and very stressful. Doing this simple thing of carrying the baby on their chest releases that stress. It's helping the parents to feel that they can actually be active in the care of the babies. It decreases the depression that the mom have after postpartum and all this anxiety to have a very sick baby. So we actually have a research going on that is showing that. The other thing is, is helping the parents to feel self-confident in taking care of a fragile baby. So as I said, there are many advantages, but I just want you to remember that we are seeing effects in the breast milk use. We're seeing effect in the, um, in the vital signs. We're seeing an effect in the way the parents are relating to these babies, especially in a very stressful moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saza, for sharing for sharing very real benefits that we are seeing with kangaroo mother care in your NICU. Now we'd like to uh, flip the perspective, um, and we have a special guest, uh, Mark Hogsett, who is the father of Grayson, now three years old, next 24-week premature baby that received KMC and is now doing well, and he's here to share his perspective on kangaroo mother care. Hi, good morning. Uh, I first want to extend my thank you to Save the Children uh, for having or hosting the press conference. Uh, also the Children's National Health System um, for the care they provided my child, uh, and then also um, you in attendance uh, for being able to hear uh, my story that I have with my son. Uh, so Grayson, when he was born, uh, from a parent perspective, it's almost indescribable, the, the fear. Uh, um, it's just the fear. It is... Um, how out of control the moment seems when your child is born, uh, especially at 24 weeks. So when Grayson was born, he weighed over just over a pound. Uh, it was very unexpected. Um, you know, when we first went to the hospital, uh, we thought we would be in and out uh, within an hour. And then the situation progressively got worse over the next uh, 24 to 48 hours until Grayson was finally born. And so during that time as a parent, you have all of these thoughts and fears, and I think this is what translates 
regardless of um, ethnicity, regardless of socioeconomic class, uh, regardless of what country you live in, as a parent, you have the hopes and dreams for your child um, that they can be president one day, uh, that they can be a, <laughs> they can be a doctor one day. Um, and those hopes and dreams start fading when you start going through an experience like this. And that light becomes dimmer and dimmer as you progress through this cycle of birth uh, at a very premature young age. And for us, it wasn't until that we got into Children's National um, and started experiencing the doctors and the nurses that started talking to us about what my wife and I, what we can do for our son to make his life better. And that's where we really started um, you know, hearing and being encouraged to do KNC. And it really was life-changing, not just for the medical benefits of our son, but it was life-changing for both my wife and I, because for the first time we were able to hold our son, we were able to be a parent that at, at the time it felt like that's what we're being denied. And so it comes back then to, you know, regardless of where you live and, you know, um, what is your status, you want the best for your child. And what we found what was best for our child was doing the kangaroo care because not only did we see uh, Grayson's um, stats improve and stabilize when we were able to do the kangaroo care, but it's just having that feeling and that connection with your child is so critically important. And so that's where I ask everybody here, as you go forward with kangaroo care, it really starts with your healthcare providers. It's the nurses, it's the doctors. It is encouraging and it is pushing kangaroo care because as a parent, we are frightened, we are scared, we do not know what's going on. It's easy to detach from the situation and it's easy to sit and watch your child in an incubator or to trust a doctor when they say the best thing is to bundle and put them aside and let life expire. It's up to the medical professions and those that are intervening to be able to push this and ensure that kangaroo care is being done. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing that beautiful personal story. With that, that concludes our panel. And we, we're here today to refresh our commitment to the preterm agenda. We're here to remind ourselves that KMC has benefits in low, middle, and high-income countries. And finally, I think Mark brought us all home today and reminded us why we are here and why we do what we do. So thank you for that. Um, with that, I want to invite um, all of you for questions to our panelists. We have plenty of time. I'm Vinita Gupta, and I have, I'm a physician who worked over 16 years uh, providing maternal and childhood care in Warsaw settings. But I'm speaking more, Mark, to your feelings. I'm also a mom of Michael Pini, yeah. who was born at 28 weeks, less than one pound. And being a physician didn't help me. It did not help me. I was just a mom there with a lot of fears like you have. And I felt like she was born here in this high resource setting, and I was in one of the best hospitals, but I felt as a mom, I did not get enough support to go through that process, and I, I had a lot of, it's also for me, as a woman of color, it was also social cultural issues that I felt I did not get support in my social uh, cultural context. So I wanna ask um, uh, Sarah, especially you, is how do the professional association of pediatrics can help um, match the rhetoric with actual implementation that would help mom and parents uh, like Mark? And I, I think it's a fantastic question and a, and a realistic challenge. Um, We've highlighted tremendous benefits of skin-to-skin -skin care, but have um, maybe only briefly acknowledged the barriers which you are starting to highlight, starting to emphasize. So it, it requires institutions really buying in and putting the resources towards it. This includes educating nurses, educating um, families of the benefits to it, 
Uh, it, it may mean distributing nursing patient ratios differently to be able to take care of these patients this way. Um, in many of the NICU settings around the country, there are cohorted rooms where may not provide the same privacy for families to do it this way. So these are, are, are not negligible hurdles to providing skin-to-skin care. I think this is such a powerful moment and a powerful statement to have the Academy voicing support along with other professional organizations so that we in our own institutions can go back and say, look, this is not just being advocated, it's, it's a better and a standard of care, and we need to do everything in our own units to provide that type of care for our patients. So um, I think that um, National Children's has a fantastic program. They're leaders in, in this type of, of work, and we hope that we'll continue to highlight other NICUs that have developed programs this way. But having worked in, um, as a neonatologist in a couple different settings now, I recognize there's tremendous variability, there's tremendous range, and there's much work to be done to improve our options for KMC in NICUs widespread. So I, um, you know, we've already shared resources in terms of the packets and information that's been put together to help guide the education of nursing staff and advocate for these practices. And I think that um, moving forward, perhaps the academy could help to make those type of resources available to NICUs online or educational programs or, um, you know, a form for which we could learn from the experiences of those NICUs that have been so successful. bit also I think the most difficult part is actually we passed the first part that it was showing that is not going to harm the baby I think that was the most difficult and a lot of studies basically emphasize emph emphasize that it's not going to harm the baby I think I think that was the the major fear that the NICUs have and like the high income countries face so we passed that and then we're showing that is actually beneficial for mom dad and mom so for the entire family, it can be beneficial. So then we are showing that it's beneficial. Now we have to train, and that is going to take time because we have to educate professionals, we have to educate pediatricians, we have to educate neonatologists, and we have to educate nurses. And um, one of the things that are gonna, is going to be a little bit difficult is take away the fear that the parents actually can take care of the babies and they can do a really good job and actually they're going to do that job. They're going to be the ones that are going to take care of these babies and we really need to have in the, in the side of the baby. So when actually what we are seeing is um, when the nurse is okay and can trust a parent, actually teach the parent, okay, those, those are the vital signs of your baby. So you're holding your baby, you're actually active because you're gonna see the vital signs. And then if your baby forgets to breathe, that, that can happen in the incubator too, you're actually gonna move a little bit more and you're gonna stimulate gentle your baby and you're gonna see the change. So basically we're educating the parents and we have to trust them. So it's gonna take a while, but I think it's something that we can, we can do it.
share with you all that I think the themes of being perspective have been well accepted and it's not sure what is associated with South Africa per se, but there is more to that. There is uh, more improved monitoring when these cities are on the transdural position, especially in the low, uh, low flow state and they are brought up for those monitors. Mm -hmm. They rely, rely on the mother or that person being the transdural mother player to check or check the gender panel. And we also rely on the medical professionals, the nurses, the clinicians as to help during the office hours. We will still take time to, to monitor these babies and transgender mother players. But then we also find that there are challenges, uh, huge shortages of staff. Mm -hmm. And we, I think she talked about this, that we really also need to prepare these mothers mm -hmm. to really help us to monitor these babies. They need to know what to monitor. Mm -hmm. They need to know what to check on these babies. continue the normal that they are in the community in their homes. Mm -hmm. So what I find and what my project is working on, I'm working for Ever Green, and also what the country is working on is to improve the provider skills, to provide this needed uh, counseling and education to the families, so that at least, although the babies are discharged alive, we also see that they come out of all abuses continue to give us the perspective we need to stay uh, positive about some of these serious cases. We're also operating in a society whereby there are a lot of barriers. They are not well accepted. Mm -hmm. So we also need to make an effort to help those patients. So there's a lot to it. It's not just a simple thing. We need to look at it as uh, yes, we if we also need that external regulation, also need uh, Can make a few comments? Sorry. I, just, I, I would love to applaud the work that you're sharing with us. This is fantastic. And um, uh, as a resource, whether, um, whether it may match the needs or not, the, the Academy in complement with the Helping Babies Breathe program, I don't know if that's one that people are familiar with, but is, a, is intended as an educational strategy for a low resource setting to teach resuscitation of newborns. And it's a portable program um, taught uh, focusing on skills with a flip chart, does not require electricity, and, and very hands-on care. We've also developed complementary programs that very much address the issues that you're talking about. And while um, Malawi sounds like is well on its way, there are so many places in this global environment that have not established as as um, intensive and, and extensive programming for KMC. So complementing the Helping Babies Breathe program, um, we have the essential care for every baby as well as the essential care for small babies uh, format. And so again, these are taught in the same manner with a flip chart and hands-on skills. So we 
go through placement of the baby, how we would secure the baby, how we monitor the baby. So thermal, um, thermal support and education. We talk about how you feed a premature baby both by cup, by pallidi, by um, nasogastric tube as needed, how much babies should be receiving, um, how we would recognize infection pages that describe how you would teach a family to recognize um, signs of, of, um, of danger for an infant. And so these are resources that are also available that I'm quite proud of the um, AAP's support for these under the Global Developmental Alliance and Survive and Thrive efforts. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in seeing these, they're um, a lovely group of educational materials to complement those that exist in many countries on their own, but should they be of assistance in establishing programs like this? And those are all available at the Helping Babies Breathe or Helping Babies Survive website. Um, and a link to these materials in many different languages um, is available, can be downloaded for free. And so um, as, as a moment to highlight your beautiful work and say um, t thank you for your tremendous efforts. So. We're actually using those materials in the lab. Oh, even better. So no wonder she's <laughs> nodding and saying she knows it. Oh, great. OK, so those in the room who have not seen it, I will again say check out the Helping Babies Breathe website. You can download these. I mean, Helping Babies Breathe itself is currently in 26 different languages available online. Again, that's the resuscitation education, slightly different issue than our talking about kangaroo mother care. But all of these things fall under the umbrella of improving newborn outcomes, newborn care. I want to build on an important point that you made that um, uh, acceptance or believing that KMC works is just the first step, and it's but it's not enough. And so I was I wanted to invite our panel. If any of you want to make comments on the types of challenges you've seen with actually, particularly with nursing, to get them comfortable with taking care of such vulnerable babies, that I imagine is a huge challenge that we face in all settings. Well, I'd like to just. Um reinforce what Alamasi said about the discharge planning piece, that when a very vulnerable baby has gone home at 48 hours from a health center, um, probably to be followed up with a community health worker. Uh, this is something that, that many people are not familiar with, but there has to be a plan that has to be very, very clear to that community health worker about how to observe that baby once the baby's back to its home to the village level um, and what the plan would be for transport of that baby if the baby wasn't doing well. So I think sometimes it's easier to have protocols for within a facility and more challenging to put that other piece in place. I want to share with you my experience. Um, as I said, I work in the kangaroo program in Colombia and I feel that babies were not discharged home if they were not secure that there was a follow up coming. And they were discharged home when it was completely proved that the baby was able to eat on their own. They can go home on oxygen, that was fine, but then baby should be able to eat and then the follow-up should be perfectly arranged and the follow-up was the next day. So follow-ups for this baby is not like in two weeks, it's not like come back when you feel that. Follow-up should be the next day because there are many things that are going to happen when a baby goes home, especially like it's a new environment. There's like a lot of things that the mom and the baby have to adjust. So the follow-up should be arranged from the next day because otherwise babies can have like very difficulties. I mean, babies can die in kangaroo care if they are not really follow-up. Um, here, babies go home, the babies go home in a like probably in like longer periods after like we are sure that the temperature is regulated and they're able to eat. So we also have follow-ups for these babies, but they don't usually go home 24 hours in kangaroo care. But as I said, the follow-up of these fragile babies should be a must. So it took that senior nurse um, to 
really insist upon, you know, maybe a little more of the confidence that she had of being able to pick up her son, um, be able, you know, for us on his throw to be able to do the skin to can skin. And so I think for me, it's, it's emphasizing, it's not good enough to say do, you know, do, do. It's not good enough um, to give the literature. It really comes down to practice. Mm -hmm. um, because the more practice that nurses have of handling both the parents and the child, the more comfortable the nurse is. And the more comfortable the nurse is, the more comfortable the parents are, and the more willing we are to do it. Um, but the first couple of tries, we didn't because we were afraid because you could just, um, as much as we're afraid, we do recognize the nurses and doctors are afraid as well. <laughs> um, and so, you know, as much confidence, yeah, you know, as much confidence can be brought in the room, you know, we found that to be tremendously helpful from a, from a parent perspective. But practice, 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 confidence, um, and being comfortable uh, will help, will help, at least help my wife and I be familiar with it. What are, what are some of the next steps that, that you think the association should take to move this, basically a statement now, into action? Mm -hmm. And what kind of questions should we be asking you in one or two years when we check in on you to see how things are going as a result of this promise that we're making today? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, within the academy, there are, there's a section on perinatology. I think that it would be helpful to also engage that group. I don't know that. Oh, it is on. Uh, engage that group and get further support and attention of, of neonatologists. I mean, this is an important statement on behalf of all pediatricians, but in this country, if the question is in reference to this country or in North America, I think... Um, uh, involving neonatal communities as a whole is, is, is really important to it. And as we were sort of brainstorming in, in light of this event, coming up with some helpful resources to build that confidence, you know, so educational programs, in-service training, um, and advocating for these practices in NICUs where, you know, we have to acknowledge that one of the barriers is also that it may be more time intensive. So in a, in a hospital setting where, you know, nursing ratios are challenged, um, being able to really dedicate that time, that's going in and out, dedicate that time to be hands-on with that family and the patient um, may may require our advocating aggressively for that type of care. Um, those are the things that I think of I, I, to the other panelists as well. Well, I think in other parts of the world, the education of nurses and midwives is usually set at a central government level, and the curriculum tends to be very fixed. So I think advocacy with um, groups within the countries to say, you know, w what does your curriculum reflect about this, about care of the vulnerable or small baby? W when is your curriculum going to be revised next? What are you thinking of putting in it? And I think that this is something that we will absolutely be making a commitment to and also talking with people at the International Confederation of Midwives about. I think that too, as you all said, the two basic things that we need is education and confidence. Uh, one thing is read about all these nice things that kangaroo do, but another thing is pass the fear of a nurse that has a baby with a tube, with central lines, IVs, a tube in the nose, and feel that, oh my goodness, this parent is gonna take care of my baby that they're used to do around the clock cares. They are used to have the babies there in the incubator, not touching them. Right. So be able to recognize when actually a baby can benefit of a parent taking care of the baby and trust on the parents. We have um, strict guidelines on when actually a baby is not stable to be on skin to skin. And it's basic. I mean, basically, if a baby has medications that are like actually working on have a heartbeat, that baby is very, very sick. A baby that is requiring those medications on a baby that have an open surgery, like an abdominal surgery, in the first week, we know these babies are not being able to be skin to skin. But teach them, the, the nurses, teach the doctors that, okay, passing those periods, passing those few contraindications, we should promote kangaroo care and you feel comfortable you should feel comfortable 
having the mom and the dad taking care of your baby. So it's education in the medical field, in the nursing field, midwives, but also it's hands-on and like be able to trust the parents and educate the parents. <laughs> Children. I just wanted to note that um, this is a joint statement and we're actually celebrating it that uh, across professional associations there, there's been an embrace of the, the, the use of KMC uh, for the benefit of the babies and, and, and parents as, as we've heard. So I just think it's important that we reflect on the fact that traditionally we've been very siloed, obstetricians, pediatricians, midwives, nurses, and here within an institution, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to note that all disciplines need to be supportive and engaged. And then at higher levels, and even when we go into countries um, working with minister, ministers of health, they don't think in terms of, of, of these specific professional associations. Right. They're actually thinking about what do I need to do as a policymaker? What right. do we need to do in our program? Right. So I just want to applaud that. Mm -hmm. That is, is a joint and, and a collaborative approach. Hi, I'm Jim Lynch, Grover, the Premium Scale and GAPS. Um, I wanted to hear from the panel a little bit about some of the challenges that are being faced uh, across the world in low-income settings, which is really the shortage of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, there is no question that skin-to-skin -skin care takes additional resources, particularly human resources. And as much as um, the evidence shows benefit, um, the system's ability to absorb this kind of uh, shift in resources is, is a probably a significant barrier. And I'd love to hear um, ideas of how we're gonna do more than issue a statement to the mm -hmm. national um, associations as pure support mm -hmm. for this movement, but how are we gonna break this gridlock? Mm -hmm. You know, KMC, skin to skin care is more than a sign on the door. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the quality is so poor in low income settings for this kind of care and, it, and fundamentally it appears everyone I've ever talked to um, that it's just a shortage of, of staffing. So how are you going to handle that mm -hmm. and move beyond policy and actual, actual action steps? Mm -hmm. uh, I can say, um, so as I said, education is critical. And I know it's an investment. But uh, the beauty of kangaroo care is actually you can educate a couple of parents at the same time. So we are also going to see babies that are like born at this kind of the same day. So what um, we do in kangaroo care is basically you can have the ability to educate a couple of parents at the same time. You can do hands-on for 10 parents at the same time. And then when you do the, your follow-ups, actually, there's a room like open to parents, and they're going to share experiences. So for example, the follow-up that should be done in kangaroo should be up to one year. During that year, the mom that has a one-year-old corrected age that is able to talk and walk is going to meet with the mom that just went home the day before. So the mom that just went home is going to learn from the mom that had the experience of having a kangaroo baby and the things that she did and her husband did or the family did as a team to help this premature baby to thrive and develop and be the one-year-old that is walking and talking. So it's a lot of community. So I feel that it's a, education is an investment, but it's an investment that actually gives a lot of um, uh, results like pretty soon. So um, when you said lack of people, I think like the idea of one person is training someone else and someone else is training, that is a way to help with this lack of resources, I feel. Well, I, I think Jim brought up probably one of the most sobering parts of the work that many people in this room do. And I would add to that not uh, just lack of personnel, but also turnover of personnel. So, you know, you come, you, you do effective trainings, you come back six months later, and the entire staff has been switched to other departments. And this happens particularly with nursing and midwifery, where nurses are midwives because they're generalists and they get pulled out to the surgical ward or something. I don't think any of us, we'll, we will win a, a Nobel Prize when we can solve this or have the solution to it. I, I do know that if something does not become part of a protocol that has a written standard, this is how we do it, it will evaporate as soon as those trainees are switched to the surgical ward. 
So the, the, the minimal thing I can think of is that there are clear written protocols that are readily available, not buried somewhere, in order to have some sustainability. I guess uh, <laughs> true, true, quite sobering, but optimistically, um, perhaps, you know, policy statements like this will help towards these goals. We need further investment from countries themselves to emphasize and highlight the use of AMC programs. So we all recognize it takes uh, dedication of resources to do it well and to do it in a way that is going to be successful. Um, my understanding, and I really think this has been a, a, a beautiful example of um, of bringing together the care that's provided both in a developed setting and in lower resource to highlight that you know, our, our use of KMC in NICUs here in countries which are more resourced highlights how important this is as, a, as an approach to care and hopefully will um, um, you know, counteract the misconceptions of it being a poor man's incubator. It is not a poor man's incubator. It is, it is, it is an, it is an option that both improves outcomes and has so many benefits that we've mentioned. Um, and so I, I really, I hope that our continued advocacy, both in resource settings, low resource settings, will put this top on an agenda so that, that the ministries and the organizations that are influencing the uh, in-service training, the education, the distribution of resources in, um, in those countries really prioritizes it. And so this is one of the areas where I become um, more involved at Children's National, but when you look at human resources, you know, the father is a resource as well. Um, you know, and I know there's cultural bias both within the U.S. and abroad on what a male's role is in, in caregiving and being able to divide your children. Um, but there is an opportunity there if human resources is that issue. Um, you know, looking at outreach programs to fathers, how you can get fathers and males more involved um, because it's just as beneficial to us um, to become as involved as well. Um, but I also recognize it's touching on a whole other issue of, <laughs> of uh, both in this country and abroad. Um, but, you know, dads, we, we are here and we, we want to help. So. I think in, in summary, the we should consider parents part of our healthcare workforce when it comes to KMC. I was amazed in Colombia to see parents hooking up monitors, unhooking their children, putting the nasal cannula on, changing dressings. It was really amazing. So. Um, okay, um, well, we're about out of time. I just want to draw your attention. There's a table outside that has print materials, the joint statement itself, um, along with some press releases and other things to look at. And all of that will also be posted online on the Healthy Newborn Network. Um, thank you all for joining, and please join me in thanking our panelists for their time and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have you done some of the yeah, training yeah. programs? Maybe we saw you at. I think I uh, saw you probably. Something near and dear to your heart. I've taught yeah. it many times, and I don't necessarily was, remember um, the whole thing.